Today, we are checking into Hilbert's Hotel, the infamous Hotel of Hilbert with its many, many infinite scores of rooms. However, running a hotel with infinite rooms comes with some challenges. And unfortunately, someone has muddled up all of the keys. All of those infinite keys are just in a big old bucket. And we have to figure out if we start pulling them out at random, what is the probability we actually end up putting the correct key on the correct room hook? Are we gonna be able to do that? Are you talking about all the hooks or just getting it right once? We're gonna just see if we can get it right at least once. So we have this infinite bucket, right? And let's suppose it's an infinite hotel. So there's an infinite rack where you're gonna hang your hooks. So go to old school with the keys. None of this modern nonsense with key cards. Got to take the key out and you're just gonna take out a key at random. You're gonna put it on a hook. So it goes on hook one. Next one, hook two. Next one, hook three. And you can say, well, what's the probability at least one of them is correct? So a good way to start with any probability problem, especially when we're talking about infinite numbers of items, let's use some helpful notation. So we're gonna say that AI is gonna be the event that key I is on the correct hook. Just so we have a way of numbering what's happening. That's our jackpot. Yeah, just, just one would be nice. So what we actually want is we want the probability that, you know, maybe A1 is correct, or A2 is correct, or A3 is correct, or dot, dot, dot. We don't mind which one. So a, just... a are the hooks. Yes, these are the hooks. So this is, this is the event, key one goes on hook one and it works, it's correct. So that could work, that could be true, is key, key one could be correct, or key two could be correct, or key three, or key four. We're not specifying which number hook has to be correct. Any of these are fine. And it could be multiple of them. We don't mind that either. So this is gonna go all the way up forever. So to start with, just to keep track of what's going on, let's stop at some number n, just to help us get a grip on what's happening. Anytime you're dealing with infinity, usually it's a good idea to say, okay, well, let's understand what happens with some very large number and then like take that limit at the end. Because if you start with infinity at the beginning, you can very easily get lost and things can get muddled. So we're gonna sort of let n be infinity at the end. Now, in order to work out what this probability is, we actually want to basically draw a really big Venn diagram with n overlapping events. But I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna just try and spot the pattern from smaller cases and then you'll Take my word for it when I write down the general formula, or if you're really keen, you can prove it by induction, if you're into that. So if we have n equals two, we're interested in the probability of a1 or a2 being true. So key one being correct or key two being correct. This is a poxy little hotel, this one. <laughs> yes, yes, this is the budget version, just the two rooms. So we'll draw our Venn diagram. This is a1, this is a2. So if we now say, well, a good place to start is to say, this is the probability of A1 plus the probability of A2. But we've counted A1, which is all of this. And then we've counted A2, which is all of this. So you can see we've double counted the bit in the middle. So we take away the probability of A1 and A2. And now we've got exactly all of this area. Because again, we don't mind if both of them are correct. That's okay. We just want like just at least one. But then suppose we had three to make it a little bit more complicated and hopefully we'll then spot the pattern. So these are my three rooms, A1, A2, A3. We want to know the probability of A1 or A2 or A3. So let's start by adding them all up. So again, we've overcounted, but let's try and keep track of what we've overcounted by how much. So we've definitely overcounted. Now let's look at red and blue, A1 and A3. So we've counted that bit twice. So. This means both A1 and A3 are true. It's the overlap between the two of them. So we definitely need to subtract that. We're gonna to have to also subtract this one, which is A1 and A2, and this one's double counted as well, which is A2 and A3. But we've now taken away all of this, we've taken away all of this, and we've taken away all of this. So that's good because this bit was counted twice and we've only taken it away once. This bit we counted twice, we've taken it away once, that little bit, and same for this little bit. But the bit in the middle, we counted three times, but we've just taken it away three times. So we've actually taken away the very middle part, all three of them, we've taken that one away too many times, so we add it back in, and that's the pattern. So we add back in A1 and A2 and A3. 
So what we've got here is the n equals 2 and n equals 3 version of something called the inclusion exclusion principle, which is an excellent name because it basically tells you what to do. And the idea is you add up all of the single events as we did there, as we did there. Then you take away the double events and then you add back in the triple events. Then you take away the four events and you just keep going, changing the sign. You include it and then you exclude it. You include it, you exclude it. And it just all works beautifully because of the properties of Venn diagrams. Fully aware this isn't a proof. I don't want to do the induction. That's, that's for all of you watching. But we're going to use the general form of this now to try and figure out what this probability is. So the general version, this is what we're going to use. So we want the probability of all of these things, or, 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 or. So this is what we call a union, which just means or this, or that, or that. So I'm just going to simplify my notation and just say this is the union of 1 to n of a i. Right? That's just this, but you know, almost like a sum. You would normally write here, but we just want all of them union together. So we then do the sum of all of the individual ones. So probability of each individual event. So we've included everything, but we've overcounted. So then we exclude all the doubles. So that's going to be um, some number AI intersected with some other one. And we saw here you have to go through all possible pairings in that subtraction part. So what does that mean? Now you'll notice here on purpose, we of course don't want to double count one and two that's the same as two and one right the order isn't important right as long as we got it once so what we do is we just say this is the sum over i smaller than j where they both go from one to n but we just put that express condition there to make sure that we're not double counting these things then we add back in the next one and now we've got i less than j less than k because we're now going to have the triple of one two three of them and by imposing this condition, we just make sure that we don't end up with 3, 2, 1 and 1, 2, 3, because they're the same thing. And then we just dot, 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 dot. And the sign is going to keep swapping. It's actually going to be minus 1 to the n plus 1. And then we're left with the probability of a 1 and a 2 and all of them up to the nth one at the same time. And we don't know whether n is odd or even, which is why I've written it like this, because this is a plus or a minus. It's going to vary depending on we saw here. The last one here was a plus, the last one here was a minus. So when n was even, it was a minus. When n was odd, it was a plus. So that's why it's to the, min to the n plus 1. So it depends on whether infinity's... <laughs> yes, whether even infinity odd. is odd or even, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll come to that. We'll come to that, yeah. OK, so this is the formula. So now we just need to know what are these bits? What are all these bits? And fortunately, the formula itself, I think, getting, you know, realizing this is what's happening is probably harder than the probabilities themselves because we just say, right, well, what is the probability of a single event? We've got our box of keys. There are n keys in the box, right? n is some big number. But there are n keys in the box. If I pull one of them out at random and put it on hook one, there's a one in n chance that I was right. So there's 100 keys. I have a one in 100 chance I pulled out the correct key to put on that hook. So the probability of any number being correct is actually just one out of n by itself, you know, individually. It's just one out of n. But then the probability of two of them being correct, again, doesn't really matter which two. Well, the first one is one out of n, and then I then need the second one to also be correct. There are n minus one left, there's one less, and they're gonna be multiplied because I need both of them to be true. So we multiply together those probabilities. Independent events, so it's that. And then it's just gonna continue. So the probability of the triple, and because all the keys are equally likely, that's why it doesn't matter what value, whether it's key one, two, 10, doesn't matter. This is now just gonna be um, one over n for the first one, n minus one for the second one, and then an n minus two for that third. And we're just gonna keep going this way. So the probabilities are relatively straightforward. So the bit that's maybe a little bit trickier is counting how many terms are in the sums, because Right, the first one here, we just have n of them. So it's just this times n, because we just add this thing, 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 over n. We add it to itself n times. But now the second one, we're summing over pairs of integers, pairs of numbers, where one of them has to be smaller than the other. So here, you can think of it as follows. Picking this first number, I have n choices. Right, am I looking at... 1, 2, 3, 43, whatever I want. There's n different things I'm picking from. And once I pick that one, this one now has n minus 1 choices. I can't pick the same one 
because we don't look at the same event happening. It's got strict inequality. But the important thing is we do care about the order because we only want to count them once. So I've got n choices for this one and then n minus one for this one, but some of them will be the wrong way around. We want i to always be smaller than j. So we're gonna actually double count. So we could get one and three or three and one. This would work here, but we don't want that. We throw away the three and one just to make sure we don't double count. So we actually have to divide by two. In red, we've got the number of terms in the sum, first two bits, and then the blue is the actual probability. So I should say this is actually the sum of this is what I'm writing down here because I'm multiplying by the number of terms. And then we're gonna get a similar thing here. So again, three of them, but they have to be in the right order. So we've got n choices times n minus one times n minus two, but we've double counted there. So we divide by two and then we triple counted there. So we divide by three. Some of you, if you're familiar with combinatorics, you're familiar with counting and choosing problems. You may have just known immediately what these were. There's a whole field of maths which just tells you what these answers are. But I always like to think about counting them myself. Now we've got the formula, what does it turn into, right? This is the magic. So summing all of this in, the probability that at least one key is on the correct hook is out of n, we're still on n at this point, that times that, so that's just one. The next term, uh, we've got an n, n minus one, so n cancels with the n, n minus one cancels with the n, minus one. got one over two. The next one cancels, 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 almost as if by magic, and we got one over so it's gonna be a sixth, but I'm gonna leave it as three times two, because then the next one, it's gonna be the same. It's one over four factorial. It's one over five factorial. So each time we're getting these factorials, which is where you take the number and then just multiply it by the one less than it all the way down to one, all right? So there is, technically there's a one here, but we just never write it. Um, and I've forgotten that the sign changes. So I've worked out all of these things, but remember the signs changing. So this is a minus, this is a plus, this is a minus, this is a plus, the next one's gonna be a minus. So we're adding together all of these one divided by factorials. Now this is starting to look like something that maybe mathematicians have studied. Feels like it could be, you know, what's like one over the factorials added or subtracted. Probably Gauss. Yeah, probably Gauss, yeah, or Euler. Yeah. Well, it, it is, it's gonna be Euler actually. Okay. <laughs> right, so what is this thing? Uh, we're gonna do more paper, but we're gonna see. So it's one minus one. I'm gonna write that as two factorial just because we want to look at the pattern. Three factorial minus one over four factorial. And we're just gonna keep going. And the last term is gonna be this one. And again, you can actually see what this is gonna be because the first one, one out of n chances. Second one times one over n minus one because we've already got that one all the way down to that. So it's gonna be a one over um, or a minus one to the m plus one over n factorial. So again, what we were expecting, we've got the factorial terms on the bottom. So this, we can actually write as a sum. Um, so, because there's a pattern here. So it's the sum from k equals one to, let's leave it at n, but this is where we're gonna let n go to infinity. And what we've got is minus one. Now the first term has to be positive. So I think if I make this k, when k is one, we need, I think k plus one there. And then the term on the bottom is gonna be k factorial. So I think that's gonna work. So sub in k equals one, we get minus one squared, that's one over one factorial. When k is two, that's minus one cubed, that's negative, and then we've got the two factorial. So I think that's gonna work. So this is now our probability, which again, some of you might know where I'm going with this, but some of you might also be like, what on earth is that? So we're gonna borrow from Euler. So Euler showed us that e to the power of x, good old exponential function, can be written as the sum from k equals naught to infinity of x to the power k over k factorial. Now this is very close to what we've got. It's for a specific value of x, and of course we need to let n go to infinity, but if we were to just calculate this for larger and larger values of n, it would begin to look more and more like the exponential. So if we compare the exponential to what we've got, the key thing is this is gonna be our x. It's minus one. So what we've actually got here is, or what we can do from Euler is e to the minus one, which is one over e, famous Euler's number, is according to this sum, naught to infinity of minus one to the k over k factorial. Now our sum looks very close to this, except we've got a different power of minus one. And so we're gonna let n go to infinity at this point now. Actually now, 
have those infinite keys in the bucket. Um, and then we just need to add in, we've got the zero term. So if I sort of take out the zero term from here, when this is zero, you get one, and then it's one plus the sum from one to infinity of minus one to the k over k factorial. So now, based on our probability, we've got an extra factor of minus one. So this is minus the sum from one to infinity of minus one to the k over k factorial. So what it means is we are almost at this, our value for the probability at least one key is correct is, you may have guessed it, one minus one over e, which is about 63% chance. So infinite bucket of keys, you take them out one by one. You take out a key, put it on hook one. You take out another key, put it on hook two. And you continue with this, just selecting them at random, all equally likely. There is a 63% chance that at least one of them ends up on the right hook. So at least one of your guests, 63% <laughs> chance, one of your guests ends up in the correct room with a key that works on their actual door. You may have noticed before, Numberphile is supported by Jane Street. They're a worldwide market trading firm using machine learning, programmable hardware, statistics, all that good stuff to trade on markets around the globe. In addition to hiring great people, they also run free programs giving a sneak peek into what they do. Here are just some of them, including WISE, which is currently accepting applicants. These two-day programs run in New York, London and Hong Kong. They're aimed at self-identifying women, transgender and gender expansive people who are about to start their first year of university. You can apply from anywhere around the world no finance experience necessary, just a curious mind. Learn who Jane Street are, what they do, and how they do it. You'll also meet a lot of great people just like you and have a bunch of fun. There's no cost to participate. Travel and accommodation are all covered. Applications close in May and June for programs taking place in July and August. Also keep an eye on the Jane Street website for other programs that might suit you. There'll be links in the description and the comments, all the usual places. What's the probability that two people get the right key or, lo yeah, or loads yeah, yeah. of people get the right key? Exactly, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you, after all these years, you're becoming a mathematician, Brady. You're asking the questions the mathematicians want to know. Okay, so um, we know, let's think about what we figured out. So before, we let because that because of course that meant there's a 37 percent chance no one gets the right yeah. key yeah 